Good morning, good morning, and welcome. We are so excited that you're here with us this morning, whether you're joining us online or whether you're here in person. We are just glad to see your face this morning. That is our hope this morning, that the Holy Spirit will indeed come and fill this place, that he'll touch every life that has walked through these doors this morning, and that you'll walk out a changed person. So this morning, come with anticipation. Come with a hope. Come with a joy on your heart, because God is moving and he's doing great things here in the church. I do have... Just a few announcements this morning for us to look at. Next week uh, is a noisy offering for the preschool. Now, normally we do a preschool Sunday, and we normally do a full-on ham loaf fundraising meal down uh, in the new part of the building there. But we haven't been able to do that because of COVID, and we won't be able to do that again this year because of COVID precautions. So instead, in lieu of that, we are doing a noisy offering next week. So bring your pockets full of change your baggies full of pennies or whatever it is that you keep your change in uh, so that we can support the preschool ministry. Uh, I have a personal connection with that as my wife is the one of the teachers down there. And it's funny because I mentioned in the first service, I said, we both come home from work and I teach high school and college and she teaches preschool. And we look at each other and we say, how do you do it? She can't deal with the older kids. I can't deal with the preschool kids. But God uses each of us in a unique way. And it's such an awesome opportunity for ministry in our community to reach the youngest folks in our community uh, through a Christian preschool and the opportunity to learn about God from the very, very youngest ages. So we truly uh, would appreciate your support in our noisy offering next week for the preschool. May 2nd coming up is Youth Sunday, and the youth will be doing pretty much every part of the service from start to finish. Uh, we will also be recognizing graduating uh, individuals in that week, which is the 2nd. The youth are away right now. They should be on their way home, from my understanding, from a youth retreat. So I'm hoping that they will be on fire for the Lord as they are starting to prepare for the second and all of the intricacies of that service. So we would encourage you to come, bring a friend, and uh, just enjoy what the youth have for you on May 2nd. June 6th is our annual golf outing fundraiser for the building project. Um, as I mentioned in the first service again, June 6th, that means summer is almost upon us. We are rapidly approaching the summertime. It doesn't seem like it's possible, but it will be here before you know it. So if you haven't already put together a team, put together a team. Janice says she might take it easy on you, but I doubt it. Um, <laughs> Jean, I saw you talking there. Are you asking if you can be on her team too? No, oh, you were. Oh, man. Jean says he's going to take her down. All right. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. You gotta, you gotta wager a steak dinner on it or something. Because I know Gene can put away some food. The, the, the boy can put away some food for sure. All right. And then on June 13th, the week after our golf adding, outing, uh, we will be having baptisms and dedications for infants here at the church. So if you know of anyone that needs uh, connected for that purpose, have them call the office. 
we'll get them set up for dedications and baptisms on the 13th there as well. We don't want anybody left out. So make sure uh, if you know anyone, you share that word. It's so good to see faces and smiling faces here this morning. Um, what I'm also seeing, though, are some empty pews, which tells me that you can invite people to come to church with you. There's an old joke that says, you know, I can't say so because I wasn't raised in the church, but people say I had a drug problem growing up. My parents drug me to church every week, which is a good thing, right? So grab your neighbors, tell them you're going to take them out to lunch. Just, hey, before we go to lunch, why don't we go to church? Why don't we, why don't we stop at the church? That'll be a great time. We'll have a good time. Then we'll go out and have some lunch together. It's good fellowship. I can introduce you to some new friends. If you're watching online, host a watch party. Invite your friends to watch online with you. Um, more importantly, grab them and bring them here. We can come together in fellowship here and, and be the body of Christ together in one place and just feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit as he moves uh, amongst us during our service. So this morning, we are going to worship. Anybody ready to worship this morning? Amen. I know I am. It has been a crazy long week, and I need to lift my voice and praise of God because he brought me through the week. And he's got me excited for the week to come. So this morning, why don't you stand with us if you're able? I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and we're going to move right into our time of praise and worship. Father, we just bless your name this morning. Lord, we lift it high. We exalt you in this place. Won't you send your spirit to move amongst us? Father God, we are here, and we're waiting. We're waiting, Lord. Don't keep us waiting too long. Send your spirit here. Fill us. Give us that joy that comes from knowing you, from loving you. And Lord, give us that peace that passes all understanding. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus this morning. Amen. Y'all can clap your hands if you want. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where your stream of abundance flow, blessed be your name, blessed be your name, when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name, every blessing you pour out. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name. Lord, you give and you take away, but my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and you take away, oh Lord, you give and you take away, still my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be, blessed be your name, blessed be the name. Your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. 
lift our voices now. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Ross, I gotta butt in. I just have to. I gotta tell you something. So, stop it, Kurt. <laughs> He's laughing at me. So, I gotta tell you, I was in Sunday school class this morning, and anybody who was in my Sunday school class with me today, would you just please raise your hand? Okay, so if your hand is up, you already know probably what I'm gonna say. We were talking about the Holy Spirit and and how when the power came on the disciples, right, in the room where Pentecost occurred and the Holy Spirit touched them like tongues of fire. This boldness and this bravery came over them and they went out and they spoke crazy for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. His resurrection, His saving power. And we were talking about inviting the Holy Spirit into us, into our today and, and letting Him take charge of you like He did the disciples that day in that upper room. And the very first song we sang was all about inviting the Holy Spirit in. This song was all about you giving and taking away. You know, God says, I give you gifts for you to use them. So use them. And if he's given you the, the spirit of, of speaking for him, he has, because he's given it to all of us. Once you say, I accept Christ as Lord and Savior, you've got that Holy Spirit power. Don't ever doubt that. So today, let that be about what you have to offer is that giving back, blessed be his holy name, because there is no more power than the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Worship your holy 
think the line we overlook in that song says, sing like never before, oh my soul. And we don't think about our soul singing. We think about our mouth singing. We think about the words that come out of our mouths. But when the Spirit is dwelling in you, your soul can't help but sing. It can't help but rejoice. It can't help but praise. It can't help but move you. Like literally, physically move you. God's Spirit dwells in each one of us. And it's that joy that lives in our hearts that we just can't help but express through our mouths, oftentimes through our, through our movements, through our, our life. We can't help but express that joy. So don't be ashamed this morning if God is moving you to express that joy, to express that joy in whatever way he leads you this morning. For some of us, it's singing these words of praise. For others, it's just closing your eyes and raising your hands. Whatever God is moving you to this morning, that spirit that's moving inside you, be obedient to him this morning. Like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. Mercy for today and faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. Pledge yourself to me, and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. You father the orphan, the kindness makes us whole, and you shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own, for you're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes, you will have your bride, free of all her guilt. Rid of all her shame, known by her true name, and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise. and saints we sing worthy are you Lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints Father, we ask this 
morning, that would truly be the case, Lord, that our praise would echo through this chamber every day. Lord, through our mouths would come the words of adoration. Lord, through our mouths would come the cry of our hearts, and that our praise would go without ceasing, for you are truly worthy. We ask and we praise you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Good morning. A long time ago, way back before we even knew what the coronavirus was, our finance committee hosted some meetings where church members had the opportunity to ask questions about church finances and they could also make suggestions about church finances. In more than one meeting, it was suggested that the congregation should be made more aware of the financial state of our church. Plans were underway to make that happen and then, well, you know what happened, everything got put on hold. The world as we knew it seemingly got put on hold, and because things were so unusual, even planning a church budget was difficult and got delayed until just recently. But the budget has been set, it has been approved by the administrative board, and things are slowly, slowly starting to unwind. Each month, I hope to honor the request that was made a long time ago and give a report on how things are doing financially here at our church. Um, this will also be included in the announcement half sheet that is in the back, so there's no need for you to take notes or anything. For the month of March, our offerings for the operating funds of the church totaled $34,238. Operating, in, operating funds include everything that happens inside the church building on a daily or weekly basis. This would be salaries, utilities, ministries, supplies, church building, and parsonage maintenance. This amount that was given in March is less than what was given in January, but it did show an increase over February. But the number is also less than the budgeted amount of $40,000 per month. Now, that doesn't mean that we spent $34,000 during the month of March. I really honestly don't know what the expenses were for March, but compared to the budget that was set for a month, we were under budget for the month of March. For the building fund, um, we have collected $39,364 since January. This is a large number, seems like a large number, but I also need to make you realize that our three-month mortgage amount is $43,500. So we were under a little bit there, too. The majority of the money that was collected was from families who had made a pledge, but there was some given from families who had not. Now, I would rather do anything than stand up and do this this morning. Um, I'd like to tell you that we had a lot of money in the church. I'd rather tell you about a great ministry that's happening in the church. But these numbers were requested, and it's important to be transparent. What you choose to do with this information is completely between you, your family, and God. And like I said, if you need a refresher, they are in your announcement half sheet. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. That reminder reminds me of an old story where the church was doing well, they had a building fund, and um, you know, a lot going on, the pastor stood up and said, we need to praise God today because we have all the money we need to pay off the building fund, we have all the money we need to pay the salaries, we have all the money we need, period. Everybody was going, yeah, whoa, praise God, we're good. Pastor said, now all we have to do is give it. <laughs> and that's true. Oh, if there is one thing that these past few years have taught me, it is that God is faithful. God is faithful. And we can trust Him and know that uh, God will see us through. And what God has started, God will bring to completion. Well, speaking of starting, uh, last week we started a look at uh, the... Um, equipment, the, the 
spiritual armor, if you will, uh, of the saint. And I want to look at one other piece of our spiritual armor today. And it is just, uh, the, the scripture I'm going to use is just a half of a verse from Ephesians 6.14. And it says, Stand firm then, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Stand firm. May the Lord add understanding to his word. Every year the Oxford English Dictionary lists its word of the year. The words, the winners are words that have come into prominence in the last year. Well, in 2005, just looking at more recent words that have come into prominence, 2005, the word of the year was podcast, podcast. In 2007, I didn't know what this meant, but I had to look it up. Uh, in 2007, the word of the year was locavore. You know what locavore means? <clears throat> locavore is when you have determined you are only going to eat locally grown foods. I, have, I am not prejudiced. I will eat food grown in Fredericktown. I will eat food grown in California. I will eat food grown no matter where it's at. I'll, you, you put it in front of me, I'll eat it. I'm not a locavore. <clears throat> So, I thought that would get a little bit more response than it did, but that's okay. <clears throat> In 2009, here's a word, here's a word I, I am familiar with because I see it on my social media account all the time. Unfriend. <laughs> Unfriend, which means taking someone out of your social media account. In 2013, the word of the year was selfie. Selfie. And in 2016, which is what I want to talk about today, the word was post-truth. Post-truth. Many people say we are living in a post-truth culture. In such a culture, emotion rules and facts are optional. If you look at social media very often, you can say that that is an accurate description. Emotion rules. Facts are optional. When the Washington Post did an article on that word of the year, they declared in that article that truth was dead. Just in the past couple of weeks, I heard one of the leading news people in the country say that it is no longer necessary to present both sides of an issue. And he also went on to say that fairness is overrated. So is truth really dead? Not according to God's word, is it dead? The words true and truth appear more than 250 times in the Bible. And here's what Jesus said. If you abide in my word and are truly my disciples, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But you have to know the truth for the truth to set you free. He declared, Jesus did, that truth is real. Truth is alive because He is alive. And because He is alive today, you cannot in accuracy say that truth is dead because Jesus is alive and He's the embodiment of truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He identified Himself. He identified himself as the truth. He said, for this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So you see, the way to fight lies, the way to fight deception is to listen to Jesus. But if you don't listen to Jesus, we're going to be deceived. As Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, and by the way, he has insight into what's going on in the Ephesian church because he's the one who went there and started the church. And he knew that that town was the center of all kinds of cults and there's all kinds of lies and deceptions all around. And so he is instructing them. He's instructing his brothers and sisters in the faith, on how you grow in the Christian faith and how you equip yourself 
to combat deceit and how you can walk in truth. And he's writing, as we said last week, he's writing this from a Roman jail. He looks outside his cell and he sees the guards, the soldiers going by his cell door. And he begins by the Holy Spirit to draw parallels between the garb of the soldier and how God equips us. And so he is describing how God outfits us, the Christian, for spiritual warfare. And unless we live our days equipped and having put on God's armor, we will be deceived. We will be deceived. Now you might expect Paul would start with a more obvious piece of the Christian's garb. Uh, such as the helmet of salvation or the breastplate of righteousness. But he doesn't. He starts with the belt of truth. He starts there because that is the most important place. You might think a belt. A belt is the most important part of the Christian's armor. Yes, because it's in reference to our minds. The Bible says as a person thinks, so they are. How you think is the engine that starts how we act. When Janice and I got married, I had already officiated oh, so many f weddings and I had been through so many, well, crazy situations in weddings. I had had people in the middle of the ceremony faint dead away, splat right, on, right in the altar. I mean, you know, if, really, you know, if it hadn't been such a, Somber occasion, it would have really been hilarious, but <laughs> I, remember, I remember one gentleman, the best man fainted, the best man, the bride and groom were doing fine, the best man fainted, but you know, uh, it was a huge wedding, and um, he just splat dead away, just had a couple of the groomsmen pick him up, cart him out, came back in, we just continued, I mean, what you got to do, <laughs> so had some, had some weird situations, so I told myself, when I get married, I'm going to be calm, cool, and collected. I'm going to be Mr. Cool, you know. Nobody's going to be able to tell if I'm nervous. And so we get there that day, and we, uh, we, we get through the ceremony pretty well, I think. We did, we did pretty well. And we just, it was just a small wedding, which helped. It was only about 30 of our closest friends. And so afterwards, we had taking pictures and stuff, and the photographer, who's a dear, dear friend of ours, a wonderful lady, since gone on to heaven, and um, she came up to me and said, you were really nervous, weren't you? <clears throat> I said, really, you think? Did it show? She said, yeah. And she went like this, and you're not wearing a belt. You forgot to put a belt on. <laughs> I said, oh, I did, I did. And I thought, well, okay, I've got my... I've got my suit on and my jacket is kind of over my waist and so nobody will notice. And at that point, right after she said that, about half a dozen people come up to me and said, why weren't you wearing a belt? <laughs> they, all, they all noticed it. They all noticed it. So there went my facade of calmness. Um, when we think of a belt, we think of a little strip of leather, a little, little, little piece of fabric that holds the trousers up. But for the Roman soldier, that's not what they thought of when they thought about a belt. It was closer to what we would call a girdle. It protected the entire middle section of your body. And so as that part of your body processes food, um, so it is that Paul is referring here to that part of us that processes information and discerns truth. How many of you, I want, to do, I want everybody to participate in this, okay? How many of you have ever been lied to. <clears throat> if there's anybody in this congregation that has not lifted up their hand, you're lying. Okay? You're lying. I'll tell you right now. You're lying. How many of you have been lied to and did not discover the truth for a long time? <clears throat> okay? You were at that time what the Bible calls deceived. You were deceived. Do you know that people live differently when we live under a lie than when we live under the truth? We live differently because we live according to the lie. Truth is important because it's the devil's most, effect, the devil's most effective weapon is deception. The Bible says that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. 
That's his native language. He lies. Jesus said that we shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth that he brings to counteract the lies that the devil brings. When the devil lies to us and we believe that lie, that starts us down the path that is not the path the Lord wants us to take. And I bet all of you can look around. You can either look at your own families. You can look at your workplace. You can look at our nation as a whole. And you can see that there are lies being propagated. And you can see that people are literally being deceived in one form or fashion. When the devil deceives us, we act on that information and we will act wrongly. That's what happened at the Garden of Eden. The devil put doubt in the minds of Adam and Eve that God really loved them and had their best interests at heart and was being honest with them. And they acted on that doubt, that information, that false information. And the consequences we're still living with today. The devil's ultimate goal of lies and deception is to get us to disobey God, to drive a wedge between the Lord and ourselves. The devil, as I said, his native language is lies. Now, I could stand up here all day and not cover all the lies that the devil tells us. But let me give you a few, just a few of the lies that the devil tries to convince us of. First of all, the devil will try and convince us that there is no hell. There is no hell. And if we believe, if we truly believe, and many people do, that there is no hell, then there is no consequence for our behavior. And if there is no consequence for our behavior, then I can treat you just as shabbily as I want to. I can use you for my own benefits and, and, and not have to worry about your feelings or your well-being. I don't have to treat you as I would want to be treated. But I can treat you any old way I feel like if there is no hell. The devil also tells us there is no hurry. There is no hurry. You don't have to accept Christ today. You don't have to do that. I mean, there's no hurry. You've got plenty of time. You're only 20 or 30 or whatever it might be. You have years ahead of you. As long as you accept Christ a minute before you die, you're covered and it'll be all right. He tells us that. He tells us that. He also tells us there's no hurry in sharing the good news. No hurry in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, you, they can hear it on TV. They can hear it. Somebody else will tell them. You don't have to hurry to tell people. Not according to the scriptures. That's a lie. The devil also tells us there is no hope. When we are discouraged, when we are discouraged and hurting, he will whisper to us, there is no hope. You might as well give up. You're not on God's list of priorities. You're way down on His list of priorities. Just, you know, just, um, just accept it and don't, don't be concerned about serving Him. There really is no hope for you. And another lie that the devil tells us is that there are many ways to God and that there are no absolutes. And that is so wrong. Listen, in heaven, I believe that we are all going to... We're, did you know, I, I was thinking about this just this morning, actually. Did you know that in heaven, there's still going to be differences between us? There's going to be differences among us. There will be. Why? Because you and I, the Bible says, will maintain our individual personalities. We're not going to be the same. We're not going to be all look alike robots in heaven. No, we're going to maintain our individual personalities. But the differences that we have are going to be subsumed. They're going to be overwhelmed by the glory of the truth that we're living in the middle of. And so the differences that we will still have, the uh, differences between us are really not important because of what Jesus Christ has done. Every single person in heaven Every single person in heaven, the one thing we will have in common is that we have been saved through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And so when the devil tells us that there are many ways to heaven and that there are no absolutes, 
That is a lie straight from the devil. So much of my work and so much of the church's work is wrapped up in fighting lies and deception through the proclaiming of the truth of the word. You remember the Old Testament story <clears throat> when Israel was at a moral low. Seems like they, their, their national life was a series of peaks and valleys. Up and down, they'd, they'd fall away from the Lord, and then they'd return, and then they'd fall away. Well, at one of the low points in the life of the, the Hebrew nation, uh, where everyone was doing their own thing, and they weren't following and serving God, they decided, well, we, we need to repair the temple. We need to repair the temple which had been um, neglected for so long. And so they went in there and they began to refurbish the temple. And lo and behold, what did they find in the temple? On a back shelf somewhere underneath a pile of garbage, they found the Word of God. They found the Word of God, which at that time for them was the first five books of the Bible. The Word had been neglected. The Word had not been proclaimed for so long that no one knew the word. And when they brought it to the king, the king tore his robes and he said, oh, no, 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 no. We've been living a lie. We've been living a lie. We've been living in disobedience. And he ordered that the truth, the truth of the word be proclaimed. So I want to outline, just give you three brief points on why the truth and its proclamation and living it out is so important today. First, the church, us, we, that's God's divinely ordained method of communicating His truth, the church. God could have communicated His truth to us in any way He wanted, but He chose to do it through His church. Listen to Ephesians 3. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be named, made known according to His eternal purpose, which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The purposes of God, what God has done, is to be proclaimed through His church. And if, you wanna, if that's too vague for you, then I will say the truth of what God has done and the truth of who God is, we, His church, are to proclaim it all of us who follow Him. It is our responsibility to proclaim and live out that truth. Almost 20 years ago, a survey was done of ministers and their beliefs. And only about half of all ministers, this is 20 years ago, I know it's gotten worse since then, only half of ministers believe that God is the all-powerful creator of the universe. Only half of ministers believe that Jesus Christ never sinned. Only half of ministers believe that salvation is received through faith in Christ, not through good works. Only half of uh, ministers believe that believers have a responsibility to share the gospel and that the Bible is the Word of God. And those low percentages of belief, you see them seeping into the church and you see the consequences uh, in society. I have mentioned this story to you before, um, but I'm only going to be here a couple more months so you can hear it once again, <clears throat> okay? <laughs> I will never forget starting out as a minister, and we, my first three-point charge uh, when I was attending seminary, it was about five miles from the nearest little town, which was about the size of Fredericktown, but I was right way out even in an even more rural area but in the middle of town was a church that was doing pretty well it was doing pretty well it was a well-established church and and you know it was a healthy church for that for that community well Christmas came around and so Christmas services which are a high point in the church year came around and uh, this church this this church that I have just mentioned got a new minister and this new minister chose Christmas Eve. You know, on Christmas Eve, you're going to hear a sermon about the majesty of God sending His Son to come for us. You're going to hear something along those lines. 
On this occasion, the new minister decided <clears throat> that Christmas Eve was the occasion where he should preach a sermon denying the virgin birth. And immediately after he did that, the church just, it just cratered. It just cratered. Why? Because the truth wasn't being proclaimed and lived out, which is the entire purpose of the church. Paul wanted to remind the Ephesian church of that. He's saying, you have a reason for existence. This is why you are founded. This is why God brought you to life so that you could proclaim the truth of who God is and what God has done. Paul said that to the Ephesian church. God is saying that to us today. We have a purpose, and that is to proclaim the truth of what God has done. That it will now be and will ever be our purpose. It does not matter if God would come back, if Jesus Christ would come back tomorrow. It does not matter if Jesus Christ would come back a thousand years from now. May He find this church proclaiming the truth when He returns. That's what we're to be about. Second reason why truth is important is truth is the basis for church unity. Another scripture from Ephesians chapter 4. It was He who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity of faith. Paul here is talking about the church and the gifts that exist in the church. Do you know why? One of the main reasons why I have the gift of ministering. It is to bring unity among us. Do you know why you have the gift that you have? And please understand, you have at least one and probably multiple spiritual gifts. You have been given those gifts partially to bring unity among the body of Christ. But there cannot be unity in the body of Christ unless there is common truth which unites us. And on the big things, there must be common agreement about the truth. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to waste time something, uh, speaking about something that the Bible makes abundantly clear. I am not going to engage in a debate about the virgin birth, for instance, because the Bible makes it abundantly clear that that is a fact. And so we're going to stand on that. And may we always stand on that and not waste our time getting embroiled in pointless controversies. But if we do not agree on the truth, if we do not agree on the truth, we are just a social club. That's all we are. We're just a social club. And we might as well go down and, I don't know, rent the, rent the VFW or something and meet there. Because we're really not that much different. No. The truth that we proclaim, stand on, live here, live out here, is qualitatively different than all other truth. A young college girl was forced to read a textbook in class that she found to be extremely boring. Just slogging through that textbook was very, very difficult, but because it was an assignment, she forced herself to read it. A few years later, after she had graduated and she was working in her field of study, she met a young professor and fell in love. They became engaged to be married. One evening, while visiting her home, the professor saw that boring textbook tucked away, collecting dust on her bookshelf. Pulling the book down, he informed his fiance, I wrote that book under an assumed name. I wrote that book. Later that night, the young woman began to read the book again. All night long, she read that book. To her, it was the most interesting book she'd ever read. What made the difference? She now knew and loved the author. When we learn to treasure the Bible because we love its author, then we know we're on our way to taking in the truth. There are sections of the Bible that can be difficult and can be difficult to discern and can be sometimes can be you know, difficult to slog through. But let me tell you, when you understand and love the author, then you're going to want to read what the author has written to you. 
I pray that you all love the author of this book because that's what makes this book come alive. I was 14 years old when I accepted Christ and I had read the Bible. I had read the Bible and I was somewhat familiar with the Bible. And I wasn't really, even though I knew it was God's word and it was God's truth, I wasn't really enamored with it. And then on a Friday night when I, when I went up in my bedroom and accepted Christ as my Savior all, all alone, and I, I, when I accepted Christ and the feeling of peace and joy that flooded over me, and I just kind of lay there in bed and I thought, well, now what? Now what? Now what am I supposed to do? And I turned and looked over on my nightstand and there was a Bible. And I thought, okay. So I picked up the Bible. I don't remember opening to any particular place. I just opened it up. And I started reading. And I remember at 14 years old, consciously thinking, oh, that's what this means. Oh, I get that. Oh, yeah, I understand it now. Why? Because I had fallen in love with the author. Because the author had saved me. There's a young lady that's still serving the Lord in wonderful ways in our, our previous stop in Caddis. And uh, Janice and I loved this young lady. She was so shy and, and backward uh, when we met her, and she was um, part of our youth group. And, um, <clears throat> and she, kept coming, she kept coming to church, and, and Janice and I, would, we liked her, even though she was so terribly backward. We liked her, and, and we would, you know, try to encourage her. And probably after, what, a couple of years of knowing her, uh, one night Janice gets a text from her. And she says, I get it. I get it. I said, what? What do you get? <laughs> and she texted her back, and in texting back and forth, the young lady had accepted Christ. And she opened up to, the, I believe, the book of Romans. And when she accepted Christ, started to read Romans, it was, oh, oh, that's what it means. Oh, now I understand. Now I get it that God loves me. When you love the author, when you love the author, it's not hard to love what he's written to you. And third, there's a third reason why worship is so important, and that is because God, the worship that God desires requires us to worship in truth. When Jesus was talking with the woman at the well, he said, a time is coming and has now come. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. All of our worship here, yes, I'm talking about music. When we talk about worship, uh, oftentimes the first thing we think of is music, and that's a very, very important part of worship and a very important part of what we do. But worship is much more all-encompassing than that. Everything we do in terms of worship, it must be centered on the truth of Jesus Christ and who Jesus is and what he has done. That is what differentiates us, again, from all other forms of gathering and forms of what I might call worship. On Easter, we spoke of how each of us needs to have a personal experience with the Lord before our faith becomes alive. In a similar way, each of us has to put on truth for ourselves. You have to put on your own belt. Your mommy or your daddy cannot put the belt of truth on you. Your grandfather, who was a preacher, cannot put on the belt of truth for you. Your girlfriend or your boyfriend, who may be a Christian, cannot put on the belt of truth for you. It is something that you must take on and put on yourself. When Jesus and Pilate had a brief discussion just before Jesus was turned over to be crucified, Jesus said to Pilate, For this reason I was born. And for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And remember what, remember what Pilate replied? He said, what is truth? What is truth? Pilate was staring truth in the face. He was staring 
the embodiment of truth in the face and he didn't recognize it. The way the armor of God is described in Ephesians, as I said, it makes it clear that we all have to put on our own belts. It's not something that somebody else can do for us. To be fruitful Christians who stand strong against many of the tides of culture today, we need to know the truth. We need to practice the truth. And as Jesus said, the truth will set us free. I get, up, I get up this morning, and oftentimes, particularly on Sunday, I'll watch like five minutes of news before I get ready and come over here. So I did that this morning, popped on the TV, watched five minutes of news, if that much. And as the news started playing, I used the filter of God's word, which I try and do. And as the news was starting to be read off, I said, nope, that's a lie. <laughs> nope, that's a lie. No, what they're saying is not true. Not, not, not that. What they just said there, that's not accurate. You see, we need the word of God to be our truth filter. We have to intentionally make the effort to know and live out the truth. We are bombarded with falsehood from every corner of society. And unless we are intentional about it, falsehood will seep in and we will become deceived. As Christians, we are commanded to walk in the freedom of God's truth. <clears throat> if we are not walking in the freedom of God's truth, we're not going to be able to adequately introduce the truth to someone else. And as we do that, and as we let the light of God's truth shine through us, our lives will honor Him and our lives will make an eternal difference. And that is what each and every one of us should do. And that is what we are commanded to do by God. We are commanded, walk in the truth. The truth of God's Word. Be saturated with God's Word. May God's Word, as I said, be your filter. Not your feelings. Not other people's opinions. God's Word is our standard now and forever. We must commit to that. We must commit to know and to live out the truth of God's Word. And as we do that, we will be free. We'll be walking in freedom. Now, are you going to get the, tr the pure, unvarnished truth anywhere else than here? I say to you, no. You're not going to get it anywhere else. Here is the repository of all truth. Saturate yourself in it. Live in it. Live it out. And you will walk in freedom. I'm really not going to have an altar call per se today. The altar is obviously open, the invitation given. But I'm just going to say, come make, make a commitment right now. I am going to walk in the freedom of God's Word. I'm going to saturate myself in it. Why? Because I love the one who wrote it. I love the one who wrote it. And the one who wrote it, wrote it for me and to me. And I'm going to know what it says. And I'm going to follow it. And I'm going to share it with others. Commit yourself to live in the truth. The truth of God's word. Today the altar is open. Today the invitation is given. Whether at the altar. Whether in your pew. From henceforth as a church. Let us commit from now until Christ returns. Let us walk in the truth of God. Together today.
Let us not be deceived, but let us walk in the freedom of God's truth. Let, and in doing so, our light will shine and we will make an eternal difference. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truth, the truth, the unvarnished truth of who Jesus Christ is, the unvarnished truth of the Word of God, the living Word. We thank you for that. May we never be ashamed of it. May we not neglect it, but may we saturate ourselves in the truth. The truth of the Word. Guide and direct us now as we go our separate ways. May we look for opportunities to share the wonders of that truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher, your plans are always good. There's not a place where I'll go, you not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you, yeah, I will trust in you, I will trust in you.
I will trust in.